high rollers today, a guy who made it to the top of the world of professional poker, the absolute top. Our chat today is brought to you by our friends at VegasTopDogs.com, America's number one handicappers. They pick winners, folks, at VegasTopDogs.com. All right, I am so looking forward to this discussion today. This guy is the 1983 world champ, first player ever to win the championship after satelliting in. Isn't that what Moneymaker did? Poker exploded. He's won four bracelets. He was instrumental in bringing fresh air into the poker room. We'll talk about that. He's co-authored several books, good ones too, with guys like T.J. Kluge, Brad Doherty, Max Stern. That's high-quality stuff, folks. He's written for Card Player Magazine, and he reps the online giant Poker Stars. Oh, and he is a newly minted member of of the Poker Hall of Fame. That's icing on the cake of a brilliant poker career. World champ Tom McAvoy is our guest today. What a pleasure. Thanks for being a high roller, Tom. Great to be on the show. we got to start with the Hall of Fame. You're going to be officially inducted November 3rd at the November 9 showdown, so to speak. Talk about pomp and pageantry, lots of it. Congratulations, man. It's well-deserved. Where does this rank on your list of poker achievements? This is really a kind of a lifetime achievement award and a validation of my entire poker career. And next to winning the main event of the World Series of Poker, which nothing can ever top, uh, this is, I consider, the, the second highest achievement any poker player can have. And I, I certainly feel both honored and humbled you know, that I'm going to be inducted with all the other poker greats tough to get in. They only put in one or two players a year, so um, it, it's, it was a long time coming, but now that it's here, I'm really excited and enjoying it, and it, it's going to start a, like a new chapter in my life. Well, absolutely. Congratulations to you. I was going to ask you this a little later on, but you mentioned that this achievement is like validation. You know, It says that you're right up there with the legends. I'm wondering... Do you feel you get enough credit for your poker accomplishments? I know you're in the Hall of Fame now, but you know when poker exploded, some others got a lot of limelight, a lot of TV time, where I feel maybe you didn't, relatively speaking. Is that how you feel, or do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I could have had a, a lot more exposure. I wasn't very fortunate in that area. Uh, in fact, I, I won a tournament that was going to be televised, and it, it finally was, but it was a year and a half later, so it's already pretty old news. And I, the few times I have had a chance to be on national TV, I made three final televised tables, and I had two wins in the second place. So I, I feel like I uh, did a pretty good job once I got it. <laughs> It's, it's tough getting there, and you know, if, if you don't, I'm not a regular on the uh, poker circuit anymore, so I don't have the opportunity to play in a lot of these uh, TV events. So if you're not in it, you can't win it, and you can't get any TV time. So uh, the people are far more aware of the ones that make regular TV appearances than uh, someone like me. I know you've been on the ballot before, and I know this is something that means a lot. I can just hear it in your voice. It just wasn't happening those past years when you were on the ballot. And I know it bothered you, Tom. Can you talk about what was different this year? Did you approach it any different way? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. Here's how I approached it this year. I did absolutely no campaigning. I asked nobody to uh, vote for me or nominate me. <laughs> And uh, I pretty well just resigned myself to the powers of the universe. So if I, I was either going to get in or I wasn't, and if I did, it was because people felt I deserved it and not because I did a lot of campaigning or politicking. You know, I, I had done a little politicking in the past, and that didn't get me anywhere. I said, all right, I about gave up. It's, it's funny because I've been, uh, this was the fifth time I was on the ballot, all five years uh, that they allowed nominations from the public, and I was I was one of the ten finalists each year, and uh, but the fifth time was the charm. So this is the this is the time I actually got in. You think that's an important life lesson because it sounds like you just let go. You know, you let it up to the powers that be. And as I understand it, once you did that, 
the phone call came pretty quick. Uh, yeah, it did. Because uh, I was on other uh, radio shows uh, before. It happened like a week before I got the call, less than a week, in fact. And I said pretty the same thing. I said, well, you know, if it happens, it happens. Uh, I said, I'm not holding my breath. I'm not, you know, before I had uh, kind of uh, hurt feelings, you know, I, I got passed over again, you know, it bothered me. I, this year, no, nah, I, don't, I don't feel that way. Uh, I've always believed that nobody has a, uh, the world owes nobody a living. I, you don't have supposed to have a sense of entitlement. And yet I think I kind of did feel I was entitled to this. Then when I realized, well, you know, poker's done a lot for me. I've tried to give back a lot to poker, but that doesn't mean they owe me anything. So I just kind of resigned myself and, uh, good things happen. It's kind of like when you're looking for a relationship. And you just can't find one, no matter how hard you try. And then when you give up trying, it suddenly it just appears. It's like boom! It's right there in front of you. <laughs> there, exactly. <laughs> well, listen, man. It, it, you, no one deserves it more than you. I, I'm wondering what you think about some of the criteria for the hall. I mean, I guess one of the stumbling blocks for you, perhaps, was the stipulation that you must play high stakes. You know, you're not there with Tom DeWan and uh, Phil Ivey on full tilt playing at these mega stakes, but. That raises the question, is the main event and all these other WSOP events that you did play, are they high stakes? Well, I certainly would think playing the $10,000 buy-in World Series of Poker main event would qualify as high stakes. Absolutely. But there's, there are several people that are in the Hall of Fame that didn't play high stakes that made other contributions to the game, and I'll give you specifics. Henry Orenstein got in a few years ago. He's a man that invented the whole card camera. He's not a high stakes player, although he did win a bracelet uh, one year in a seven card study event. Linda Johnson, same thing. She doesn't play a real high cash game stakes, uh, very modest when she plays. And uh, she did win one bracelet in a Raz event, and she's in the Hall of Fame. And I certainly don't begrudge those two people uh, for being in because they made other contributions to the game. And, he, and also, uh, Benny Binion. The senior, the founder, he's in. So is his son, Jack Binion. These are not high stakes as a cash game player, but they made contributions to the game. They belong to being there. And, you know, in addition to my winning the main event and the four total bracelets, um, I feel like my other contributions uh, all by themselves should have given me serious consideration, which it did, as it turned out. All right. Well, let, we're going to talk about some of those things in a second. But first, you know, so much history in the Hall of Fame, all those legends. Forgive me for saying this, but <laughs> uh, you're sort of one of the poker old-timers now, Tom. When you were a so-called young gun, who were some of the players that you looked up to? When you were breaking in to big-time poker, you had to be in a little group, I, I assume, you know, talking poker and strategy and trying to improve yourself. Who were some of those guys for you? Well, the guys that I talk poker with a little bit were are pretty much uh, guys I played uh, in my like I played 10, 20, 15, 30 uh, games both seven card stud and holding games so, and uh, most of those guys were not exactly household names but they were good solid winning professional players I never had a chance to pick the brain of one of the like the superstars of the era and there weren't that many uh, poker players that had kind of universal recognition when I broke in. Um, there was Johnny Moss, of course. Uh, there was Doyle Brunson. There was Admiral Slim. Those were the three biggest names in the poker world. And I didn't, uh, I played with all of them at various times, but I didn't have a chance to, like, pick their brains. Is it, is it tough? Was it tough for you, like, when, you, when you're breaking in and just starting to play some high-caliber poker, and there, there's Doyle Brunson and Amarillo Slim and some of these other guys, Johnny Moss, all in a group. Was it tough to break in? Were they pretty private? Pretty much. I mean, you know, I was never in, a, like, a, a clique or part of the in crowd. In fact, that was one of the things I think that uh, might have hurt me in prior uh, Hall of Fame balloting. I, I really wasn't one of the good old boys. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same age bracket as some of them. But uh, a lot of those guys broke in together playing uh, in, you know, private games, especially throughout the Southwest, Texas in particular. 
And I never did that, although I did play a few private games in Texas that was in the mid-'80s. We're talking about these guys that go back to the 60s and stuff. Uh, some of them are, are not well-known anymore, but are in the Hall of Fame. It, uh, played in those games. And um, I was never part of that crowd. And I, I was an, an accountant from Michigan. And I did buy one of the very first copies of Doyle Brunson's book when it first came out way back in 1978. It wasn't even called Super System like it is now. And I, he had a publishing company at the time, and I tracked it down where the publishing company was. I went in, and there he was. So he, I, I got him to sign a book. Oh, wow. And, and he said, he's later, he told me, he says, I thought you were just fresh off the farm. <laughs> when I point, I pointed the finger at him and said, one of these days, I'm going to be sitting right at the same table with you. You just wait and see. <laughs> but it happened. You know, four years later, uh, we're both at the final table of the World Series of Pope for main event, the year I won which was the very first year I got in. And he came in third that year. Uh, and that was the last time Doyle ever made the final table of the main event. So wow. He's won other things uh, since then, a lot of other things. And he, uh, I think he, he rather, he, he prefers to be known as a, uh, not only as a two-time world champion, but as a guy who played uh, real high stakes for his entire career practically. So that's, that's kind of his legacy. Absolutely. I mean, Doyle Brunson, uh, that, that's what he did. He just played, and he won those cash games. Let me ask you, you, you get the autograph from Doyle Brunson. Four years later, you're at the final table at Texas Dolly. You win the event. Did he make any comment about that initial meeting when you got the autograph? Uh, only years later. He, he said, he, he might have been kidding, but he said he did actually remember me years later. Um, that that brief encounter in his uh, office of the publishing company that he had. He didn't have that publishing company very long. And, he said he uh, did not remember you? No, he said he did remember Oh, me. he did, okay. But I don't know if it was just being polite <laughs> <laughs> or what, but uh, taking him at his word, that was, that was flattering that he would remember me at all. I'm well, sure you saw other people uh, say they'd challenge him someday. Uh, what a great story that is. Let's talk about your legacy for a bit here, that heads-up battle. And we talked earlier about one of the criteria in the Hall of Fame, high stakes. I'm sure when you're sitting there one-on-one -on -one with Rod Pete for the championship ring, the title, the glory, and the money, and it's the longest WSOP battle in history until, of course, the Chip Reese andy Block showdown. But I'm sure when you're sitting across from Rod, you're thinking that you're in a high-stakes showdown. I mean, it's one-on-one -on -one for the title. Can Tell us about your opponent and that battle. Well, I've been playing Rod Pete in the same cash games all over Las Vegas. Uh, we're, we played a lot of 10-20 Hold'em together. That was our main game. So uh, he and I were casual friends, at least. Uh, you know, we'd socialized a few times. You know, we had a lot of mutual friends and, you know, played in the same circle. So I was quite familiar with Rod Pete. Some of the big, other big names in poker, of course, uh, they didn't know either one of us. So I was very pleased when it got down to me and Rod. And uh, Rod actually is a player that broke Doyle Brunson three-handed. Of course, they made Doyle the betting favorite before, before the final table started. Well, of course, because he's the known guy, right? Exactly. He had, uh, Rod Peter actually had the chip lead going into the last table. Doyle was second in chips, and they made him the betting favorite. And I was third, and I was well behind uh, both. Rod and Doyle, and they made me in a nine-handed final table, eight to one odds to win. Wow! So, so let me ask you this, Tom: when 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 Mr. Pete breaks Brunson, you said you were happy when it got down to you and, and Rod. Was that because you knew his game from all the cash games, and you felt you had an edge? Yeah, several for for several reasons. Uh, you know, it was I wouldn't have really cared who I played. You know, a lot of you say, oh, I don't want to play Doyle Brunson. You know, they, they figure he, there might be an intimidation factor, but that wasn't the case. I have to admit I was rooting for Rod because I knew Rod and um, I was friends with him. And it was going to be kind of a, exciting no matter who I faced, but it gave me a little extra pleasure that 
I got to play against Rod and somebody I really knew and who I liked and respected. How long did you play? Went over seven hours. Wow. It's still the record for the longest heads up play in World Series history. And back then, the tournament was a four day tournament. Well, it went well into the fifth day. Wow. Now listen, you, you've had some epic, I mean absolutely epic heads-up matches, and you've, you come out on top in these battles. You beat Pete for the world title. You defeated another world champ, Barry Johnson, uh, to win a bracelet in Limit Omaha. And your first bracelet in Raz, you've got two in Raz, but you bested the Irish legend Donica O'Day. I mean, those are big names. What is it about your play or your style? I mean, don't you get nervous? I mean, what happens when you get down to heads-up here, Tom? What's the secret? <laughs> It's funny when, when I was uh, playing at the final table as a in the main event at the World Series back in 1983. Uh, there was a lot, a lot of TV cameras. They were still filming. It's not like they do now today. You know, where live feed and all that stuff. Yeah, they made a documentary out of it, right? Exactly. That's what it was. And uh, they asked me that question. I said, "Well, don't you get nervous?" I said. The only time I'm nervous is when I'm talking to you guys. <laughs> you know, when, I, when I'm playing, I'm totally focused on the game. So being in front of cameras has never bothered me. It, you know, the game is still the game, so you focus on the game. That's what matters, you know. Well, listen, how good did it feel uh, to come into the WSOP's first ever Champions Invitational and end up winning it? How good did that feel? Well, that's a good question. I, they interviewed every one of the participants. There was 20 of us. There was, I think, at the time, 25 or 26 living uh, main event champions, and not all of them, for various reasons, could make it, but 20 of us did. So they did an interview before we started playing with all of us, and I, I told them, I said, there is nobody in this field more determined to win this event than I am, because... I feel like I have something to prove. But I, I think that I'm not getting as much respect. I remember that. I remember seeing that quote, and, and you were really in the zone. I mean, you wanted to win that badly. Uh, very much so. They had a special uh, trophy called the Binion's Cup. It's the only time it's ever been awarded. It was the first and only time. Although maybe it will resurrect it down the road. So, and I still have that trophy. And But in addition to that, it was a vintage Corvette, a 1970 vintage Corvette. That was, 1970 was the year they first started the World Series of Poker. So um, they, they had the vintage car. Do you drive that around, Tom? Well, actually, my wife is wearing it on her finger. <laughs> she said she would prefer, a, you know, a diamond suitcase. Because <laughs> 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 she was quite happy with that little one. <laughs> so I never actually drove the car. It, it never left. Uh, I never took it out of the parking lot at the Rio, and I, I sold it. And um, I, I never regret it. If I was a little bit younger, I always wanted a for that. I might have uh, uh, considered keeping it. But now. I figured one of two things would happen. I'd either get a lot of TV tickets to the bright cherry red, or I'd kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't like to hear old so, Hey, listen, um, a, a friend of yours and one of the uh, members of High Roller Nation, Daniel Stryker, she set up this interview. I guess she's friends with you. She's written a book. She's going to be a guest on the show. It's called Poker Samadhi. Can you tell us about that and maybe your involvement with that, with, with her in that book? Yes, I uh, I'm working with her on a very similar uh, book that she is uh, kind of my editor in chief, and we're we're working on it together. Her Poker Samadhi book is now out in the Gamblers um, Book Club here in Las Vegas and other places. And I'm I think you can get it online, but I'm not quite sure what the procedure is for that. But it's it's more like bits of philosophy, both poker philosophy and life philosophy, and that's what mine is doing. Mine is uh, basically you might almost call it Poker Zamati 2. Out <laughs> 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 first with Poker Zamati 1. And I'm not sure what we're going to call it exactly, but I, uh, it's, 
not like my other books. You know, people don't buy books as much as they used to anymore. So this is going to be an e-book, and it's going to be, you know, fairly inexpensive. And um, it'll be, uh, I said, it'll be kind of a short read, you know, and it won't be the same thing as the, you know, a lot of the uh, poker books that I've written and other people written, you know, they're like uh, textbooks. You know, you have to study them and reread them and reread them. This isn't quite the same. It's more like a philosophy book. Well, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Tom. Um, you know, you're columnist for Card Player Magazine. You've co-authored more than a dozen books, I believe. You got some more coming out. Two-part question: What has writing taught you about poker? And then. In turn, what has poker, you know, traveling the world, playing all these tournaments, making your life in this business, taught you about life? Well, several things. When I write, you know, people think I like writing. Actually, I like the results of writing. <laughs> the process. You know, the toughest thing for me to do when I'm writing is to sit down in front of the computer and type the first word, the first sentence. After that, it seems to flow out of me, but I, uh, I'm a chorus procrastinator when it comes to doing that. You know, I've missed more than a few deadlines. But once I, once I get cracking, it kind of flows out of me, but it, it's hard for me. This doesn't come natural or easy. I never thought of myself as a writer. I was approached to do the books that I read, and then all of a sudden I was making a lot of money out of them, so it kept cranking them out, you know, we were doing uh, about one a year. Sometimes we got out two in one year. So we did a, a lot of books. Uh, I thank my good friend and editor, Dana Smith, for being the driving force behind it. And then I uh, recruited, uh, along with Dana, we recruited T.J. Cloutier, and he co-authored the four books with us. Uh, and then he did one on his own with Dana. And then I did two with Brad Doherty, and um, I did another one with Don Vines, who was the uh, deceased husband of Dana. So uh, we just, uh, and then I did a couple on my own. So I just kind of snowballed, you know, it was nothing, nothing that I thought of ever doing. I, someone had told me, I started my poker career, I'd wind up being a, an author. I would say, you're crazy. <laughs> well, I don't know anything about writing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, it was kind of an on-the-job learning process. And because I'm trying to give out balanced, good information, it forced me to really, really think and focus on what I had to say to make sure that I was giving out uh, proper information and not misleading people. Because there are a lot of poker books out there that have advice that's not so good, as well as books that have great advice. So you got to sometimes kind of uh, wade through them and decide. The books that I, I, I give a lot of credit to are the ones written by professional-level players. Anything written by Dan Harrington, I, in particular, I always recommend to people. Uh, as well as my own books, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, there's, there's other good authors out there. I'm so, I mean, not the only um, author that has something worthwhile saying. So I, I direct people to other uh, other authors and other books that uh, I think will help them. Uh, You've been playing at, at the WSOP, Tom, since the uh, late 1970s, I believe. Um, what are some of the things that you have seen over the years in poker that have changed for the better? What are some of the issues facing poker today? Well, of course, the biggest change for the better, in my opinion, uh, was when it was finally went non-smoking in 2000. And you were a big part. I was going to ask you later, but let's talk about it now. You were a huge part of that because I understand that you approached uh, Becky Binion about doing a non-smoking event. Everyone thought you were nuts. They didn't like it. But you stuck to your guns, and now look at what's happening. I mean, you really were at the forefront of that. Yeah, I was. I wasn't the only person, of course, that was uh, you know, advocating non-smoking. Um, I, I hosted three years before the 2002 World Series in 1999. I hosted the first non-smoking tournament in Las Vegas history, 
at uh, Samstown in Las Vegas. And we, we got a lot of flack from the smokers that said they were, were going to boycott the tournament and they weren't going to play. Well, a lot of them seemed to mind and played anyways. And um, a lot of the players that couldn't stand it anymore, couldn't stand the smoke, started coming back. You know, they forgot that the most there's more uh, non-smokers than smokers in huh. the world now. So more people came back that couldn't stand it. The smokers, they didn't have to quit smoking. They just had to take it outside. So basically that's what they did. You know, smokers aren't going to quit playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <happen. laughs> Sorry, but you know, you're going to have to just uh, be a little more accommodating. And then something funny happened. The smokers decided they, they preferred the cleaner air themselves, where they could breathe more, breathe better. I remember at, at the Dominion for years, when they allowed smoking, um, they had terrible ventilation there. So there was always like a big cigarette haze and cigars and everything else that people were smoking. And people were getting sick all the time. There was all kinds of bronchial ailments. And you didn't have a good option. Your option was either put up with it, maybe get sick, or not play. You know, those weren't very good options. And it went on for years. But finally, um, the casinos realized it wasn't just a matter of, well, what's, the, what's the, the morally right thing to do, which obviously would be to preserve and protect people's health. But it was made good financial sense that they're actually going to get a better, better turnout without smoking allowed than that it would with it. I mean, the, there was about 25% of the players were hardcore smokers, and, and some of them really objected and, and did reverse petitions, threatening boycotts and stuff, but it didn't work. The vast majority were wanting it to go non-smoking. And once it finally got established, it was like um, a dominoes one after another fell. Yeah, just rapid fire. Yeah, it was rapid fire. After that, it just swept throughout the country, and, the, and even in Europe was a big holdout, and they finally capitulated to at least in most of their venues, maybe not in all of them. Well, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you that uh, you know I I played poker a long time, but I was never around when you walk into a poker room and they're, they've got ashtrays at the table and they're sitting there smoking. So for me to you, thank you for that because I don't know if I could have handled that either. I gotta tell you. So thank you very much, Tom. We're running out of time, but I know you've got the big ceremony coming up on November third. Any thoughts on the class of thirteen or the spectacle? That is going to be this November 9 showdown and the Hall of Fame induction ceremonies. Well, the induction ceremonies are going to be great. Uh, Scotty Wynn, my, uh, who's also the other inductee this year, because they only put in one or two a year, uh, is certainly uh, worthy of being inducted. He's not only a main event champion, he's won like five bracelets and numerous other events, and he's quite a personality. So he, he, he is the most worthy inductee. Um, the so, some people, so i got to cut you off. Some people have said that, you know, Scotty with that big 50K horse event, final table being drunk and obnoxious, that might have hurt him. But, but, you know, when you look at the credentials and the guy, for he, he is very friendly. He's outgoing. The people love him. He's the prince of poker. I mean, he, he is fully deserving of that honor. Yeah, I, you know, I, I used to say the same thing. I think that he needs to be eventually forgiven because he was on the ballot like I was several times and got passed over and I think uh, and he was a much bigger name than a lot of the people that uh, did get inducted and I think that drunken display during the horse tournament that was nationally televised of course hurt him but I think he's toned it down a little not that he's totally quit drinking but you know that was kind of his uh, personal makeup for a long time where he, I think he realized that he went too far and that he drank too much and that uh, it was time to kind of tone that down. So he is, um, basically I think Polk World says, okay, you were wrong, but we forgive you. Absolutely. I mean, look at what he's done. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, who is without sin? You know, cast the first stone. <laughs> exactly. Regret. It is a big spectacle nowadays, and you and Scotty are going to be up there as part of the ceremonies. Back in 83, you know, when you're standing on the chair and your arms raised in victory, could you have ever imagined poker where it is today? No. Who would have, who would have, like, who would have thunk it? <laughs> when, when Moneymaker won, they had a record number of entrants, 839 or so, something like that. It was over 800 for the first time. The very next year, it tripled to like around 2,500. Year after that, it topped 5,000. And then it kept going on and up. The record was still, in Jamie Gold won in 2006, uh, there was over 8,000 entries. And um, the last few years, it's been in the, the 6,000s. But still, when you think about it, the year I won, they had 108. Now, there was no such thing as dead money back then. No, I mean, they're, they're caliber players, right? Yeah. But, <laughs> but the evolution of poker is just uh, incredible. Um, it would have been virtually impossible to predict that. Yeah. I've been asked that many times, and so have other uh, players that have been around for a while, like I have. And nobody all this coming. Well, the other thing too, Tom, I, we just interviewed Greg Raymer and he mentioned it too. When you look around the table these days, you know, the, the second worst player at the table today is maybe the second best player at the table back then. There's so much information. The caliber of play has gone way up. Listen, Tom, thank you so much. Uh, four bracelets, the 1983 world champ, newly minted member of the Poker Hall of Fame, and it's well-deserved. Thank you so much, Mr. McAvoy. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. Good to be on the show. Take care.